We do, we are, we are. Okay, so let's play E4, playing Grigor Georgiev. So he plays the French. Now I've experimented in the French with various lines. And this time I'm going to play the Tarash. This is what I play as my actual main line. Now in the Tarash, it's sort of a version of the advanced French, where white builds up this pawn chain and black attacks it. Now the reason we put the knight on d2 and not c3 is because I now have the move c3, which defends the pawn. Now where does the bishop belong here? On which square would the bishop be most active in this position? Yeah, we can do something tomorrow. I'll, I'll write you. Bishop d3 is correct. And uh, now knight gf3 to defend the pawn. And this is where things kind of get cool. This is still theory. Um, why not bishop b5 is something I'll explain afterward. And he goes f6. Now this move is kind of a famous mistake. The drawback of this move is that it creates this diagonal for my queen. And I want a queen to get on h5. So what I need to do here is distract him in order to get my queen to h5. Distract him often means sacrifice. By sacrificing something, we're able to, to divert his attention away from needing to defend against queen h5. So what sacrifice would do that? Yeah, I'll talk through everything after the game. We haven't had many Frenches. I know that I haven't fully explained the ideas for, for each side. Knight g5 here is correct. There's more to this than that logic. There's a lot of variations, but this is a famous move, um, which leads to a lot of complication. Knight d takes e5 is black's best response here, opening up the d7 square for the king. If he takes on, on g5, I go queen h5, and his king gets into a lot of trouble. That's not the end of the story. There's a lot of variations there. I don't actually know all of them. But the logic verbally should be clear to people. I want to go queen h5 because never play f6. And he can't castle because his bishop obstructs his king from escaping. Um, why is knight g5 an effective move that distracts him? Because the knight also attacks e6. So he needs to attend to that. And in attending to that, he cannot also defend against queen h5, if that makes sense. Um, but but the, the bottom line is I want a queen on h5, and I want to do it with tempo. If I move my knight, let's say, to h4, that would be a telegraphed pass, as we say in basketball. Okay, so he decides to defend e6, but he does allow queen h5. And um, it's sort of one bad thing or the other bad thing. Actually, that's okay. So this is where a lot of people slip up, because there's a lot of tempting moves. It's not entirely clear which of them we should prefer. Knight f7 here is super tempting, but... That's not the end of the story, because if we go knight f7, he actually goes queen e8. I want people to pay very careful attention to this, okay? And what happens then is that our queen is going to be pinned. Our knight is actually going to be pinned. So we don't actually want to play knight f7 here. We want to basically say this, okay? He's already moved his king out, which is good. So we can decide between a couple of things. But the simplest is just to drop our knight back to f3. There's nothing wrong with just saying, look, his king is super weak. His position is bad. I'm not going to deal with any of the complications that arise after moves like knight e6 or knight f7. I'm just going to play the Russian school of chess, bring the knight back very, very slow. A lot of people get into trouble because they assume I have to have a win here. Let me spend three minutes trying to find a win. They don't see anything. They get frustrated and they go for a move anyway. It's totally fine to make a modest move and basically celebrate your small victory. So now what's going on? He does have a connected, protected passer on d5, but because it's the middle game, I don't really care. Our plan now, obviously we don't we don't want to trade queens because we're attacking, is to complete our development, which means we need a castle. And we need to bring this bishop out. This bishop is blocked by the knight. So where can we put this knight uh, such that the knight also accomplishes something and get this bishop out? What square would we potentially put the knight on? And what would the knight be doing on that square? What would the knight... Yeah, so knight b3 potentially aiming for d4. But first let's castle. You guys already know the square in front of a passed or isolated pawn should be blockaded. Now, do we need to defend this pawn? Here's a here, try this on precise. Do we need to defend this pawn or can we play knight b3? So, what should you notice here in this position if you've been practicing tactical awareness as I have suggested? The king and the queen, ladies and gentlemen, are on the same diagonal. Okay, that everybody should notice that, which means that if he moves his knight away and we take that knight. We'll be able to pin him in the end. But that's not even the main reason. The main reason is the e-file getting opened is going to be a disaster for him. That's going to be worth the sacrifice. If he sees it, uh, let's get the bishop out to f4. Not because we're defending the pawn, but because we're creating an x-ray against his king. That's the main reason we're putting the bishop on f4. Also, it's good to defend them. But how should we continue deploying our pieces such that they basically prepare for attack? Prepare slowly, attack fast. We don't need to play knight d4 yet. Let's play rook c1 for now. Let's see what he does. 
And we can also put the knight on c5. That's also a super active square. But I like the move knight d4 because it exploits the pin. Where can this knight go from d4? Yep, he allows it. Where can this knight go now? Yeah, we can go for this beautiful outpost on d6. He's done a really good job getting his king to relative safety, but he's done that at the cost of all of these positional things. And king on b8 is not going to be safe forever. We're gonna, eventually going to use our pawns to uh, kick away some of his pieces. And I think the c-file is going to be what we're going to use to ultimately get to him. Yeah, that square is amazing. So when I say we're going to use our pawns to kick away his pieces, what specifically do I mean by that? What move am I referring to here? Yeah, so we're going to play b4. There's a pretty complicated reason why knight takes b4 is bad. If he plays it, I mean, you'll, you'll be able to see. And that reason relates to the knight on b4 being unprotected. Um, and if you look at the whole board, you'll notice the x-ray that the queen is exerting on the knight. Uh, whenever there's an x-ray like that, you should be thinking discovered checks or discovered attacks. And so we'll eventually have the move bishop g5. Beautiful, guys. You all see it. Now, a lot of people here would just mindlessly play a4. Now, there's a really, really cool... Oh, look at this variation. We're going to play a4, but not mindlessly. Because here's the thing. He's probably going to take the pawn. No, he's not. Okay, he kind of acquiesces. But I would, I'll show you guys what happens after he takes the pawn. Okay, how should we proceed? Oh, Ro Haskell, thank you about it. How should we proceed? So I'm actually going to give you guys a crazy thought. Let's not play rook c1 yet. Let's first take away the c6 square from his pieces. Because here's the thing. If he plays a takes b5, a takes b5 we might immediately put the rook on a1, which is a newly opened file. This is simply more flexible. And you guys know the expression by now, the threat is stronger than its execution. Guess what? I am going to put the rook on a1. And the reason I'm going to do that is because there's a knight there. And c1 is a little bit better defended by his pieces. The squares along the c file are better defended by his pieces because it's closer to his pieces. The a file, on the other hand, is like the Wild West. Now we can go bishop e3 and skewer his knights. All right. So, okay, so he does a good job trying to trade the knights, but he doesn't have enough resources to make it happen. What can we do? What can we do? So look at this knight for a second. This knight is, is a type 2 undefended piece, which means if we apply pressure on it and then this knight moves away, it's going to be entirely undefended. So we can actually play the move bishop to e3, putting pressure on the knight. If he takes this one, we are not going to take with a pawn. That would open up his bishop. It wouldn't blunder the rook because we attack the queen. But we take this one because now... You guys can see that the a7 square is under our control. Uh, now we start looking for various checkmating ideas. We also need to bring the queen into the attack. Queen a4 is actually not very possible because of knight takes b6. But where can we put the queen so that we both defend the bishop and sort of aim indirectly at the a5? Where can we put the queen? Yeah, we can play queen d4. I don't really like parting with the bishop, but... You know, parting with it involves the queen on b6. That would be pretty crushing. So he has to choose between several equally unappealing options. Later, we can bring the bishop back before playing queen a4. We can also play bishop a7 check. Um, in these positions, as I've emphasized in various points, uh, there's usually multiple ways to finish the attack. And you kind of have to choose. It, it's often a matter of taste. And um, you shouldn't be obsessed with necessarily finding the best option or assume that there is only one. You should try to be precise, but... Uh, you should do that without, you know, losing on time or anything like that. It's always a balance, if that makes sense. Okay, bishop f8 is a good move. He's stopping our bishop from dropping back to c5. We can still go to a7. Oh, p Joe with another 5. We can go to a7. Um, that's possible. And actually, not only is that possible, that's what we're going to do. Let's drag the king to c7. And how do we keep pursuing the king? How do we keep pursuing the king? Um, rook c1 is correct. Very good, guys. Now look at this beautiful square. Ah, oh, don't we want a rook on this beautiful square? Let's get bishop b6 back in so that we can pave the way for the rook to come to c7. Now notice our back rank. Our back rank is not an issue. Queen b4 is a good move. I missed that one. But no problem. Just retreat our queen. It's okay. We just retreat our queen. That's the thing a lot of people struggle with. They see a move like this, they panic. We don't actually need to panic. Now we're going to create some lift for our king. And um, let's bring our bishop back so he can't take it. He's actually done a really good job defending. He's still losing. 
But uh, I have to give him some kudos. Let's take b7. This is completely lost, though. Uh, his position just collapsed. Now, where can we put our queen to angle at his king? Which square can we put our queen on? Why don't you guys let me know? Okay, queen h6. Yeah, good job. He's going to lose on time, but um, he, he's completely lost here. Maybe I didn't attack in the best possible way, but that's another thing that you should bear in mind. When you put pressure on your opponent throughout the entire game, uh, you put him under so much pressure that it takes time to defend against these threats. It takes time to defend well. That's a thing in classical chess also. That was a really nice game. Now the Tarash is knight d2. Knight c3 is more popular. That's sort of the main line. But knight d2 is what I play. The broad you know, cost-benefit analysis here indicates that we can play c3 later, which builds up that pawn chain. On the other hand, we block the development of the bishop. So there's a clear plus and a minus to this move. And um, we played, according to theory, up until this point, f6, I think, is, is a con considered a mistake because of knight g5. And there's some really complicated lines here, uh, which I don't want to delve into too much, but I'll just show you guys one one cool idea. So after f e queen h5, and um, after g6, we can take on g6 and go queen g6. And now if I remember correctly, I might be wrong here. Uh, why not bring the dark squared bishop out before that knight? It's a good question. So why why are we even bringing the knight out? Well, because he's technically attacking the pawn, Mr. Lama. So we can play bishop e3, but we blunder the pawn. So sadly, we have to attend to the pawn. So that means, you know, we can't develop an I, in an ideal fashion. If we could, yeah, we would definitely play bishop e3. So bishop d3 is a legitimate move. But what happens then is he takes, and he uses this bishop to develop his pieces with tempo. So he gets this little edge in development, and then he strikes in the center. Uh, this is a legitimate variation, but white doesn't have any advantage here. Another five volt. Oh, Yolo Sapien three gifted. You guys are spoiling me as always. Thank you, Yolo Sapien, Chess Genie, PDX, Lion, and Dark, Dark and Chris. Loving the hype, folks. Does that make sense? Yeah. So basically, there's a lot of finer theoretical points that I'm not telling you guys. So all four. Thank you. Which is like 92 is more popular here. This is the old school move. And basically, I can explain why like knight e2 is usually played rather than knight f3. The old school reasoning. There's two main reasons that people of the old school play knight e2. The first is they thought this knight could go to f3, and that would open up the pathway for the bishop. And it would, it would protect the pawn, right? Which is super important. That's number one. Number two, black has this very typical idea in the French, which looks psycho, but is actually very common, which is g5, g4. Are you kidding me? Another five. James Barnett, 93, five gifted. Damn, girl. girl. Five gifted, another. Another bomb, thank you. Appreciate it so much, James Barnett. And this could dislodge the knight from f3. And by dislodging the knight, the pawn on d4 loses its support. Now, you guys might be looking at this and saying, bro, like, what's the big deal? I can just take on c5. Why are we trying to hog this pawn on d4? Well, that breaks up the pawn chain, okay? And that creates a weakness on e5. So black can take c5, and then we'll have a very hard time defending this pawn. Does that make sense? Our center collapses. And um, therefore, we need to keep the pawn chain intact. But according to modern theory, none of these ideas are that scary. Like g5 can be met with h3, and black doesn't get g4 in it. It's just not that simple. Also, this is a very weakening move. Thank you, Thylomanoid. Appreciate it. I don't know if that makes sense. Anyways, knight b6 is sort of an admission of defeat. Check. Now knight back to f3. So that's the piece of advice I have, which is that um, if you if if the tempting move results in a mess, remember that you can just accept the small victories in the position and save time by making a quiet move. Thank you, James Barnett himself subbing. The knight of seven, queen e8, pins our queen. And um, this, you guys can see, I think, appreciate that this is a mess. Maybe he wins the knight, maybe I win the rook. Um, and... Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I forgot to elaborate. So in this position, after g6 takes, takes king e7, we use the sort of the wish list thing. What do we want to achieve here ultimately? We're two pieces down. Could somebody, Pap Studio, thank you. Could somebody tell me what is the, like, the number one item on our wish list here? We want what piece on what square? Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of, bishop takes g5 is basically checkmate. It wins a million pieces. So we need to apply the same logic that we applied when playing knight g5. We need to distract him somehow. And in the time that he's distracted, we get the bishop out to g5. So what move seems maximally distracting? Bingo. Exactly. So this knight is centralized. 
The knight itself controls a lot of squares. He kind of has to take it. And now bishop takes g5 is crushing. It's technically not checkmate. He can give up all of his pieces. But now he's just down a queen. So uh, I think, according to theory, this is not winning for white. Black has some counter sacks. I don't want to delve into it. But I think that this is good for white. I'm not positive, though. But that's basically the idea. The reason we don't take the rook here is because black would have two pieces for a rook. And we would basically give black a chance to bring some defenders into the game. Uh, and this position would be unclear. Now, Chris Cap asks, what about knight takes h7? At which point? Well, knight takes h7, it's still it's black to move. And black can get his bishop out, connecting the queen to the rook. And again, we're pinned. Winning only a pawn here is, is not the point. We're striving for more than that. Also, remember something. There's still a battle going on on the western front. The western front is this pawn chain. This pawn chain is still liable to collapse. Let's not forget about that. So if this attack doesn't work, uh, we might not have enough resources. We might not have the time to bring our resources back in time to defend this pawn chain. It collapses, and then it's anybody's game. Um, does that kind of make sense? Also, as Aquila points out, if we castle kingside, guess what? We've opened the h file for black. So the winning the pawn just isn't sufficient. That's why I brought the knight back to f3. Sorry. Because we also defend the pawn chain. Okay. Yeah, it's only to get a tempo. Otherwise, black has time to defend. So he takes everything. Of course, we don't trade queens. Now we castle. We complete our development. Knight b3, bringing the bishop out. Rook a c1, bringing the rook into the game. Knight d4. Everything here is very, very straightforward. Now we bring the knight to a very juicy square. And here the move b4. Knight takes b4, as you guys already pointed out. This knight is being x-rayed and it's type 1 undefended. So bishop g5 attacks the queen, exposing the attack on the knight. Winning a piece. Believe it or not, the move a4 has exactly the same logic, but it takes a little bit of finessing. So knight takes e4, how do we deconstruct this position? Here's what I see. I see the knight on a4. Knight on a4 is type 1 undefended. It's also x-rayed by the queen. There's just a one problem with the x-ray. The pawn on b4 is blocking the x-ray. So we go b5. Incidentally, the move b5 attacks the knight, which means he has to attend to that. He takes. But we still don't want to move the bishop, because now the pawn defends the knight. What do we want to do first here? Yeah, knight takes. Exactly. We attack the rook. Black has to attend to that. And now finally we go bishop g5 with the same idea as with the knight on b4. Queen has to move. And we win the knight. So, photo chess, thank you for the raid. Another raid 106. But that's still not the whole story. Believe it or not, that's still not the whole story. Because the x-ray actually fails. What move does black have here? I always tell you guys, thank you Maria, when there's a discovered attack, you need to check whether the piece that's defended... Sorry, whether the piece that's attacked can, cannot move and defend the other piece. Queen b4 actually defends. So what do we need to do first to stop queen b4 with tempo? And then we finally will be ready for bishop g5. Amazing sequence, in my opinion. We need to go back to d6, attack the rook again, block the queen's pathway, and now we go bishop g5 and attack the knight. So it's a long sequence, but I hope I've made every step of that clear. All of it with tempo is super important, otherwise black can defend. That's a nice line, which means he can't take, he has to drop it back. And here, believe it or not, the move rook c1 check, which a lot of people wanted to play, kind of plays into his hands. Because it helps him make his king safer, and I had already anticipated potentially bringing the rook to a1. So b5, blocking his, his access to the c6, where making this knight super passive. Now we get the rook to a1. We bring the bishop back to e3 in order to open up the file for the queen, the rank, and also to tie ourselves to the b6 knight. He takes this one, I take that one. He brings the knight back, we get the queen into the game. If he takes, we'll have access to the a7 square, that's absolutely deadly. Bishop f8, bishop a7 anyway. We chase his king around, and now we bring his king to e8 and go rook c7, infiltrating. This is like the final stage of the attack. I didn't play this perfectly, but it was good enough. Um, pawn to b6 was double-sided because I thought about this. The problem is we'd have a hard time bringing the bishop into the game. And he basically does the same thing he does in the game. I guess we can go through b8, but that would take some time. You see what I'm saying? Thylenoid with a tier 2 sub. Thank you. So bishop b6, infiltrating. We're not trading queens. Making some luft for the king. Thank you, Su-19. And finally, we simply take the pawn and deploy the queen into the attack. We're threatening various sacrifices. White Black is completely lost here. I could have found better ways to attack. I don't want to delve into that too much. 
Um, why not bishop g5 to attack and clear the row, asks the Adam 34. I'm assuming you're referring to this position. Well, the problem is we need to recapture a piece, right? He's just captured a knight, so we need to recapture. Um, so we need to find the middle ground here. I know it's it's weird to find the middle ground these days. Uh, that word is not used much in society, but in chess, you sometimes do need to find the middle ground. Um, so bishop a7, rook c1, and bishop b6. Uh, also, bishop c5 would be good. Just trading bishops and then getting the queen over to the c5. So I hope I've kind of made everything clear. I'm omitting some key details. I'm omitting some key details, but I, I hope that I've partially explained the logic behind the attack. Thank you, Pasarao, for the prime. And uh, any questions, guys? Any questions? Yeah, so rook c1 was possible there. Yeah, it's minus 1.6, but if you if you let it think for a while, I think it changes its eval. I think that's a common thing. Yeah, I agree that it's complicated, but I hope that people can still trace the logic. Uh, the variations are complicated because that's what chess is. But Jam Jam, another five, girl! Girl! But everything we did is relatively straightforward in its intention. It's just justified by relatively complicated lines. And um, hopefully I've made that relatively clear. Okay, let's play the next game. Thank you for the five gifted Jam Jam. Let me write down game two. Okay, let's go. Yeah, I know. And that's why you practice calculation. Calculation is, is a way of getting your logic to work. Okay, let's go with another e5. Exo Stark, that guy watches my stream. So let's play the two knights defense against the Karakhan, which is kind of a thematic way of responding to the Karakhan. The Yolo Sapien, another five, amazing. And here, okay. So this is a, a legitimate variation. Let's go bishop to c4. Wow, Paul Kellerman, that wasn't a, wasn't a very good guy. And let's tickle the bishop. Let's see what it wants it to do. And uh, white's play here is very straightforward. We simply develop. Okay, so he takes, we take back. We have the two bishops now. Quite nice. Now we need to get our king back. And we need to develop the bishop. What should we do here? Let's be very careful. Uh, Black has a bit of an annoying idea that we want to prevent. We can prevent it. And it totally Daniel 10 subs. Raising the stakes. D4 to stop 95. Amazing, guys. Thank you so much. What the hell? Amazing. Now let's castle. We don't we don't have to worry about knight takes c4. Incredible, guys. Yeah, so he can take and go knight f6. That's typical. Now we need to find a good place for our queen. Where should we put our queen here? Who can. We can tell me a solid, nice square, so it doesn't block the development of any other pieces. So some people, so queen h4 would walk into bishop e7. Queen f3 would blunder the pawn. Queen d3 does everything. Queen e3 would obstruct the bishop. Queen e2 would blunder the pawn. We could sacrifice the pawn, but I'm not really in the mood for that. I want to keep things simple. Now white is slightly better here. We have the two bishops. Black's position is also super solid. So this is going to be a, um, thank you so much, Tricky. This is going to be a long game. And we got to be very patient here. So let's, where should we bring our bishop? This is where things get a little bit tricky. So bishop f4 is where I know a lot of people want to put it. But let's consider what he does. After bishop f4, he goes bishop d6. And he trades off another pair of pieces. And I don't want to give away my two bishops. So that's where I say not every one of your pieces needs to be devising a way to distribute the COVID vaccine. We just developed the bishop. Is the bishop amazing? Not necessarily, but it's perfectly decent on d2. It's still controlling the diagonal. And at least we preserve our two bishop advantage. I know some people are thinking it's passive, but remember that piece placement for the most part is temporary. Um, it, it's okay to have one of your pieces not be its, at its maximal activity uh, at, at any given point of the game. So... Let's go a4 now to grab some space on the queen side. And in Ikesi, in Ikesi Castle's queen side, we'll kind of be prepared to, to attack him with pawns. We're sort of preemptively trying to discourage him from castling queen side. If he castles king side, this move will still be healthy because we've grabbed some space on the queen side. Nothing wrong with that at all. He, he, he x-rays our queen. Who can tell me what we should do in this position? It would be a nice idea here to reposition the queen to get out of the x-ray. Where should we put it? Yeah, rook fe1 was, was possible also. 
Yeah, queen, queen f3 is good. Yeah, queen f3. Queen g3 would bond to the queen. Queen c3 would be a little bit awkward. I'll explain the full decision logic behind this move after the game. But um, there is also a very specific tactical reason behind this move. Hopefully he will allow us to explain it. He doesn't. Okay, now it would be a good idea perhaps to deploy our bishop through f4, although he can go back to d6, and we might have to bring the bishop back again. So how should we defend this pawn instead? What would be a very robust way? Yes, c3, defending the pawn with a pawn. As I've explained many times, um, that usually is the best way to defend, particularly an important pawn. We're preserving our advantage, we're nurturing it, we're bringing our pieces to better squares. I wouldn't rush to make a plan here. Uh, let's see how he positions his pieces, and that will inform us more about how we should position ours. Queen a5. Okay, so let's unpack this move for a second. He's attacking the pawn. The move b3 would defend the pawn, but it would also weaken the c3 square. So let's play bishop b3 instead, because that way we maintain control and we maintain the sort of health. Ah, oh, that's an annoying movie made. I actually missed this move. Uh, but that's okay, because, hmm. Sadly, we're going to have to play queen to d1, bringing our queen back in order to not allow him to take the pawn. That's okay. The position is robust enough to where uh, we don't have to worry about having to make a move like that. It's okay. Uh, not ideal. And he plays a very, very good move in a turn. This guy is playing super, super well. Okay, so because we have the two bishops, we're going to open up the position. Um, mm, but he's got an annoying item. That's actually not that good. He's got rook takes d2 as a big threat. He's got rook takes d2 as a very big threat. Um, hmm. So let's let's do some damage control here. We gotta go rookie two. We gotta def we gotta redefend the bishop with the rook. I don't like the fact that he's pinning us, but we can get out of the pin with queen c2 on the next move. Um, he learned from my speed run. No, no, white is fine here. Uh, white is completely fine. It looks a little ugly. It's a little iffy, but I don't see uh, a concrete way for him to actually make something of this. His pieces are active, but we're gonna try to push them away. Now, what are what are our ideas? Look at this h7 square very carefully. What idea can you propose, guys, to try to exploit that square being weak and to try to exploit our queen being on c2? Bingo! We can reposition our bishop to b1, creating a battery. Now, you guys might look at this and say, well, what's the utility of that battery? If the knight's defending that square, well, that ties down his knight. And I've explained on several occasions that tying down one of his pieces could be good both positionally and tactically. It takes it out of the game. And also, it creates the potential for tactics that exploit the knight. The knight could get overloaded. Imagine that he assigns the task, uh, the knight another task. An overloading tactic could result from a situation like this. That's another really, really good move. Let's get our bishop to e5. Let's try to remove that knight from the board so our queen could gain access to the h7 square. Uh, hopefully everything I'm doing is making sense. Okay, so he's probably going to do this. Uh, we're not going to make a draw here. Let's bring our bishop back to c1 for now. Let's let's uh, take a take a chill pill and let's see how he positions his pieces. Let's continue trying to get this knight off the board. Uh, that's basically what this game revolves around. Okay, so we can make a marginal improvement to our position by doubling rooks, just bringing this rook to a slightly better square. Uh, G four would be too weakening. I will after the game spell out my logic in this position, but I'm trying to explain every move for now. We're just trying to make small improvements to our position. Ultimate goal is to get the knight off of f6, if we can. So now, bishop e3, he'll again play bishop c5. So his bishop acts as kind of the gatekeeper. But one thing we can try to do here is... Um, well, we can try rook e3, rook f3, but then he's going to play bishop f4 again. Um, so let me think. Okay, let's... Hmm. Let's push our pawn for now. Let's get this pawn to a square where it's more advanced, and we can protect that pawn with b3. And the idea of c4, b3 is dual. What idea do we have by playing this? What idea do we now have? It's appeared because as a consequence of the move c4. Bingo, bishop b2. And finally, it looks like he's, he's going to have some trouble keeping that knight on f6. Now, it might seem like no big deal to you guys who might play g6. But g6 is a very weakening move that in and of itself creates potential for tactics. Also, we can just take the pawn on h6. Bishop b4 is super strong. Because now, if we, if we play bishop b2, he meets it with rook to d2. Uh, this guy is playing very, very well, and it's an honor to have viewers like these on my stream. But let's not forget about an old idea. What old idea 
now seems to be quite possible because his bishop no longer has access to the f4 square. What, what idea now becomes very plausible? Okay, so bishop c5. He wants to meet bishop b2 with bishop d4. Man, not letting us get through. But let's tickle him with bishop f4. And, okay, let's repeat. Let's repeat moves. Now we need to find a way to make another marginal improvement to our position. How do we make a marginal improvement? Now, one thing I want to make very clear is that, um, okay, we can go rook e5. We can centralize the rook. And we can tie his bishop down. Okay, so he blunders a pawn. And that was the idea. My idea was to tie his bishop down to the c5 square to overload his bishop so that the bishop could no longer gatekeep the knight. Okay, rook to b8. Now we can get our bishop out to a better square. His rook is kind of tied to the back rank because if he moves it away, yeah, that's right, get back. Now, can we put this rook on a protected square? Can we put this rook on a protected square so we don't have to deal with, or we can be protected? We can protect it with a move before. In the interest of time, I'm going to have to play a little faster. Now we can go rook b5, not rook a6. That would have led into a discovery. Ooh, that's a good move. But here a little tactic. He's attacking two pieces at once. What can we do? Rook takes b6. Malcolm, you're the best. This should be three. Ah, but he takes. But now we have a pass pawn. Man, this guy played this game like a GM. The queen e2. Now it's equal. I missed that in the end. But in the time scramble, you have to make the decision that, okay, now I'm going to play fast. And he blunders the knight. And finally, and he blunders the rook. So he collapses here in the end. Amazing game by Exo Stark. That was a really, really interesting game in general. It can teach us a lot about positional play. Good game. Good game, sir. Um, okay. So in time pressure, he collapsed in the end. Now, let's unpack this. We're, we're going to skip the opening. The opening was very normal. Uh, I got a slightly better position here. Just takes. Queen back to d3. So in this position, right, every other move would have a drawback. Queen e5 would walk into bishop d6. Queen e2 or d e1 would blunder the pawn. I could have considered sacking on e2. Um, queen f4 would block the development of the bishop and walk into bishop d6. Queen h4 would walk into bishop e7, creating a nasty pin. And if we unpin ourselves, eh, I don't want to create the situation, right? So instead, let me open up a new instance of the game. We play queen d3. It does everything. It doesn't block the bishop. It defends the pawn. And it lets the rook occupy the open file. h6, bishop d2. Bishop f4 allows bishop d6. This is the thing. A lot of people, they automatically choose the most advanced square for the piece. That's what I want to get people not to do as much of, especially at a higher level. It's not all about a piece controlling maximum amount of squares. You also need to consider where your opponent is going to put his pieces. And if there's something you want to try to preserve, such as the two bishops, you, that's exactly where a move like bishop before could be bad because trading the bishops removes the two bishops on the board. We no longer have an advantage. Thank you, Matthew. Welcome. Okay, so he castles, rook a1. Welcome, Exo Stark. Good, great game, man. Amazing performance. Thanks. And um, basically, okay. So rook a1 bringing the rook in. Why didn't I play rook f1? Well, to be honest with you guys, I thought that in the future, I might have a plan associated with f4, f5. Uh, breaking down his e6 pawn and opening up the diagonal for the bishop. This, by the way, is a very typical plan in these positions. There is one small problem. If we actually go f4 here, which way is black going to castle? And I can even show you guys a game of mine where I applied this particular idea with a lot of success against a good player. Like this f f4, f5 idea when the bishop is on c4, you guys should consider castle's queen side. That's the good thing about being flexible. That's the great, and it's like going second in a concert. You know, you're in a piano concert, uh, the first guy sets the bar, and then you know exactly where you can how well or badly you can play. Uh, that's why I would never like to go first. It's the same principle here, right? We wait for white to show his plan. And then we're like, joke's on you. You weakened your king. And f5 is not as strong because black's king is not on g8 anymore. He can just go e5. And uh, the fact that the bishop is now open is not as effective. Does that kind of make sense? So for that reason, uh, I kind of regretted this a little bit. I go a4, grabbing space. Rook d8, queen f3. Now, what uh, is the rationale behind putting the queen here? There's a very specific reason. And that reason connects with stopping him from castling. Stopping him from castling, why? What tactic do we now have? Well, sacking my rook would not produce sufficient 
attacking chances. Bishop h6. Overloaded pawn. Queen takes f6, wins the pawn. This is a simple overloading sacrifice. So he drops his bishop back. I was quite impressed with Exostar's ability to detect tactics here. He didn't miss any of this. Now we go c3, defending the knight, defending the pawn. Queen a5. Now bishop b3. This is where I think I made a mistake. I think, in retrospect, it might have been a good idea to sack this pawn and play a move such as rookie 5. Basically go for... Uh, basically go for a position like this, where his queen is out of the game. And... Um, Awesome, Archers Major. Congrats. Fantastic. Getting into MIT is no laughing matter. That's awesome, man. Uh, and very happy for you. Glad you're celebrating by accompanying me on the stream. Basically, uh, this produces some compensation. I, I, I honestly missed the move queen b6. Now we have to drop our queen back, and precisely at this moment, he opens up the center, which leads to a pin. Now, if we escape the pin immediately, he has rook takes d2. The queen is overloaded. And he's got two pieces for a rook. For that reason, we have to defend the bishop first. Now we bring the queen away. Rook d7, bishop a2, deploying the, the bishop to b1. Now is the next stage of the game. The battle here revolves around whether we'll be able to get his knight out of f6. Every single move in the next 20 moves revolves around whether I can get this knight away. That's what I'm trying to do with bishop f4. He stops me with bishop d6, stops me with bishop c5, otherwise bishop d4, bishop c1, and I decided, okay, let me keep this bishop here, find a new way to do it. We get our rook to a good square. b5 I thought was a little unnecessary because it allows us to create a pass pawn, which we advance. And the, the reason we advance it is also because of bishop b2 is now an idea. Our opponent stops it by getting active. If bishop b2, then bishop d4. You guys can see, like, we're both trying to posture for position. And um, he's kind of keeping the gate closed to his knight. This is where I think I found a very nice move, rookie 5. Um, rook e5 kind of pins his bishop to his pawn, activates my rook, and he blunders with bishop d4. Mm, what should a black have, what should black have done? Maybe bishop b4. I think that now the rook obstructs our path to the knight. This is completely fine for black, probably quite equal. And uh, after rook takes a5, bishop f4, uh, a blunder by me, rook b5, allowing this fork. And I, I should have probably not gone b4, kept the pawn chain intact, and just gone rook b5. Enjoyed my extra pawn. Uh, and, uh, yeah, white is up a pawn here. Black is not in any huge trouble. I mean, the game continues. But b4 created a weakness on c4. That's a type 2 undefended pawn, which he imme immediately exploits. And ultimately, I forgot that he can take the pawn. Black is completely fine here. It's a drawn position. And it's just unfortunate that finally, in time pressure, exo blunders with g6. I think black can go knight d7 or something and go knight e5, and uh, black is black is on the positive end of a draw here. So why was pawn a5 such a good move? I mentioned it was good in the game. Um, the reason this move was good, well, let's say he doesn't play. Let's say he plays a6. Could somebody string together a sequence of moves? Remember what the battle revolves around. Watch you guys. Five bucks from Young Jones. Thank you. Remember what the battle revolves around. Don't worry. Uh, the battle, battle revolves around me trying to get my bishop to one of these two squares. And that would allow me to do the b4, knocks the bishop away from c5. And now what becomes possible? Again, pay attention, think about the ultimate goal here. Bishop where? Bishop b3, bishop d4, bingo. And black is in trouble because I kind of want to take and go queen h7. That's not the end of the world, but this creates a lot of pressure on black. Now, if he goes g6, uh, I talked about this move weakening his position. What specifically becomes possible here? White has a beautiful tactical idea uh, that exploits the fact that this f7 pawn is overloaded. People should see that. This pawn is overloaded. It's defending two other pawns. And um, we can exploit that with a rook sack. Uh, this idea is quite typical. I can find you many, many instances of exactly this kind of tactic appearing on the board. In fact, I can do that right now. Um, we, I can find something very, very similar in, in some game. Um, using chess bases position search feature. Here's a good example of that happening. One second. Okay, now you should see the game. So this is just a random game, uh, but hold my beer. Yeah, <laughs> but essentially, what is black? I want somebody to find white's move in this position first and foremost. What is white's move here? I qualify. Yes. Yeah, bishop b1 first. 
And black knows g6. Now, what should you notice in this position? What possibility should you notice? And, and, and that doesn't mean you should make that move, but you should at least be aware that the, that the possibility of rook takes e6 exists. B takes a5 by Mr. Schmidt. Super clever move. Look at this little rascal. Ah, I blundered a3. Oh my god. He's crap. Ah, joke's on you. Rook takes e6. Black blunders. What should black have done in this position instead? How should black have permanently ended this idea? And rook takes e6, up a piece, and white won the game. Bishop f5 is correct. So awareness is one of the keys to tactical success. A lot of people solve problems and they say, I still blunder. I still miss this stuff. Well, you also need to set, you need to open up that metal detector. You need to make observations before a tactic happens. That allows you to prevent blunders, right? If you've noted to yourself, ah, I need to watch for this on every move, at least for a couple seconds, you're less likely to miss queen takes a3. Rook takes e6 and white wins. Very simple, but uh, nonetheless quite instructive. Okay, now you guys will not forget this idea. So this is similar. Okay, so that's why a5 is good. And uh, there were more. there's more to talk about in this game, but I also want to keep things dynamic. I hope that this more or less makes sense. Yeah, why didn't checkmate him? Um, oh yeah, can I show the checkmate after the rook sack? Let me just show you guys another example of this, perhaps a little bit less. Um, ah, let me show you guys a slightly different variation on the theme. Game between two very good players. 2200 against 2200. White to move. Who can find the move for me? Take your time, guys. I need to take another, I need to pee again. I just had a jar of coffee. Now I'm peeing and I'll grab some more water. So give me a moment, guys. I'll be right back. What's the move? E6 is the move. Okay. We want to disattach the F7 pawn from the G6 and look up even further. We got more subs. Let's look at the, let's look at the move. So the idea of the move E6 is to disattach. Yeah. Let me, let me finish the water. Hi, I forgot to get water. Oh my god. Uh, disattach the f7 prom from the e6. After, and the rook takes e6, rook e6, f6. We need to combine two concepts. Back to the game, guys. Thank you so much to Siebs. Appreciate it. And Despart with a prime. We need, to, we need to combine two concepts I've talked about. Concept number one is the wish list. What do we want to achieve from a general perspective? Like, what is the general thing that we want to have happen? Now, we need to understand how we need to go about this. A lot of people are saying the most tempting move, which is knight h6. But white finds, I think, the best way to instantiate this. Because here's the thing. The bishop is a nice defender. If we go knight h6 and you calculate this, it's actually not that simple after bishop g7. There is no direct checkmate. So what Loudner thinks is, okay, I need to do this, but I need to get the bishop away from f8. And so how do we do that? And I need to play with tempo. You can't just go anywhere. Bingo. You guys see the logic behind this? Now, if black takes... The king is a lot more alone. And so the move bishop takes g5 creates unstoppable threats against black's king. Like here, here, this is just completely winning. So basically, uh, Frosch goes queen f6, gives up a piece, and he lost. Ultimately, that is what black has to do. But knight d6 is the concept of finding the best execution, right? Finding the best execution. Knight h6, knight e7 check, by the way, also bad because it gets lets the queen into the defense. So very, very precise play. And that's another way to instantiate these concepts. But let's go back to the speedrun. I know everybody's anxious for the next game. The finish after bishop d6? Well, I mean, why not knight d6 first? Well, because, because remember, you haven't completed the aim of disattaching this pawn from this pawn. So black can just take the knight. The move order here is really important. Charlie and I will be talking about that on Monday. Yeah, so how exactly does checkmate happen here? Well, for example, if bishop e7, then that covers the escape square this is made. If queen e8, then we go queen h6. And I call this kind of move rolling out the red carpet. What do we roll the red carpet? Actually, we don't even need the red carpet. We just made him like this. Bishop h7 was also possible. If king f7 here, then bishop g6 wins. Um, could you have gone knight d6 before e6? No, because bishop takes d6. And again, this position is good for white, but it's not winning. Right? Does that make sense? If you go e6 now, remember, as my coach would say, this isn't checkers. Black doesn't need to take anymore. Knight f8, black defends the pawn, black is up a piece. Yeah, I know that's what you guys are thinking, but remember, taking is not forced. Here, taking is a lot more forced. 
because white is also going EF. And uh, and this is just crushing. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, let's get back, unless there are any more questions, let's get back into the speed run. Another huge shout out, 50 gifted from T-Seebs. And uh, yeah. Knight just uh, gets out. Well, what about GF? Yeah, so GF, um, well, basically, white achieves the same effect here of weakening Black's King. So I think he takes f5 is the idea. Composition 1 and 2, thank you. And after knight f6, queen g6 is checkmate because the rook obstructs the queen, the king's escape. Thanks for another sub. Levy invented the phrase. Well, this it's a Russian phrase. Uh, Levy did not invent it. I didn't invent it. It's existed for many, many years. It's like a typical Russian chess phrase. This is also mate. You just drive the king into the corner and you checkmate him like this. Um, okay, so the rook sack. Okay, guys, let's move on. I've, I've already shown the mate after the rook sack. What? Yeah, I know there are specific questions, but I think you guys get the gist of it at the Nyshavki. I think you guys get the gist of the line. I don't want to bog ourselves down too much into the actual uh, sort of the, the, the details. 